I trust you have given some consideration to the catechism question this week. Must those who have been redeemed by grace alone, through faith alone, still do good works and obey God's law? And as we saw simply this morning, the answer is yes. But I want to use our time in the Word tonight to speak briefly on the subject of good works in the life of the believer. I've titled my message, More Than Words, as you can see from the the screen there. And that is a title that I borrowed from the song title sung by a group called Extreme back in 1990. And the message that this song tried to relay is that saying I love you needs to be expressed in more than just words. It needs to be followed up by acts of affection. And I won't go further than that in case I embarrass anybody. It needs to be followed by acts of affection. In a similar way, the Christian faith is not just about us saying we are saved, we love the Lord, we are children of the King, we are joint heirs with Christ. These are all true and right, but as we will be reminded from a number of texts tonight, our walk needs to match our talk. Or as James would say it, I will show you my faith by my works. Our text in Matthew 5, which we read earlier, recalls one of the most familiar sermons uh, taught by Christ. And there is a great crowd that is gathered. We, we read in chapter 4 that people have come from many regions, Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Christ has been busy. As he passed through some of these regions, he has been teaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he has been healing disease and affliction. And in fact, if Luke's chronology is right of these events. Christ has healed the man in Capernaum of the unclean demon. He has healed Simon's mother-in-law and many who were sick and demon-possessed. He has cleansed a leper, healed a paralytic, healed the man with the withered hand, and all of this while calling his 12 disciples. Jesus has been doing all of this using all of these opportunities to reinforce exactly what he was teaching in the synagogues as he went through these regions. And so indeed, Jesus was being true in word and in deed. He is our perfect example of our teaching corresponding to action, which is why he can say in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so this is the, the brief backdrop to the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm not going to cover all the verses that we read. Um, There there are many, many sermons that can be spoken on this text. But we must recognize that Christ has seen some of the pain and misery of sin that has been brought on humanity through disease, bodily deformity, demon possession. And so he addresses the disciples and the multitude around him with a message of hope, much like we've been seeing in 1 Peter. There is a better inheritance, a promise of new life for all who belong to the kingdom of heaven. In this life, we might face difficulty. We might face abandonment and rejection. We may even face persecution, scorn, mocking from the world. But for the believer who is in Christ, God is our heavenly father. And therefore, as those opening verses in the chapter say, truly we are blessed We can be children of God who are joyous. And so I have three simple points for us to consider tonight regarding good works in the life of the believer. And you can see them on the screen. We'll consider, firstly, not saved by our works, but then saved unto good works and close our time together as we consider the purpose of good works. Coming back to our passage in Matthew 5. So first of all, not saved by our works. It's becoming increasingly um, evident to to the elders the number of young Christians that we have coming into our congregation. Young believers who have had very little to no Christian influence in their lives. They've not been churched as children or maybe even had a generational heritage of Christianity. Um, And some of these concepts that might come so easily to us 
like not being saved by our works, is something that requires a little bit more uh, in-depth teaching for those young Christians. And I actually wonder if this is in some way God's judgment on society and family and humanity as we've neglected observing the Creator's design for His people, that we observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, but rather we choose to honor the idols of leisure, family, entertainment, sport, you fill in the gap. I'm not saying that those are bad things, but when we substitute the best thing, the worship of God, for these things, we do so to the detriment of our souls. But let's come back to the point about not saved by our works, that we should not assume that every believer has the same understanding about their salvation. When we were outside of Christ, living in the flesh, living in the trespasses and sins that we inherited from our forefather Adam, and then continuing in that way because that was our nature, there was no good thing in us. There was nothing we could do in and of ourselves that could please the Creator, God. Paul would phrase it in this way when he addresses Titus in Titus 1 verse 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Remember what Tommy spoke about this morning? They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. What about these words in Romans 3, which are also very familiar to us? As it is written, none is righteous, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Did you notice how encompassing those pronouns are? None, not one, no one, repeated several times, and not even one. Nothing we do in our flesh can ever be good enough to earn us favor with God, to give us a favorable standing before God, to even earn us salvation. Paul uses a slightly different angle in Ephesians, speaking to the same point regarding the insufficiency of our own works. Before salvation, not only were we incapable of doing good, but we were completely dead to God. We had zero appetite for the things of God. Consider Ephesians 2 verse 1. Also, these are, these are not unknown verses to us. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before we were in Christ, we followed after the passions of our sinful ignorance. Again, this just follows on from what Tommy taught us this morning. Paul in Colossians 1 talks about us being alienated from God through our sin. So if in our sinful flesh we have no desire to follow after God, why do we try and argue for us having some role in choosing God? The answer is simple. We don't. And we wouldn't. Unless God awakens us through His Spirit and makes us alive, we cannot respond to his gracious work of salvation. I love the way that Tim Keller explained it in last week's catechism, Catechism 33, where he says, salvation is all of God. As soon as we try to add something of our own to save us, we actually subtract from what Jesus declared to be finished on the cross. You might be an unbeliever sitting here and wondering, well, what hope is there for me? Christ is all the hope you need. How thankful we are that God does not leave us dead in our trespasses and sins, but he goes on to tell us in that same passage that salvation is a free gift of God. And right where you are sitting tonight, you can call out to God. Confess him to be your Lord and Savior. Acknowledge your sin before him and he will save you. 
Acknowledge that Christ has fully paid the debt for your sin through his death on the cross. His word assures us that he saves all who call upon his name. And so I trust that helps us to understand that indeed we are not saved by our works. But secondly, we are saved to good works. We are saved unto good works. The evidence of this good work, the good work of salvation through Christ having been done in us, is that our lives are now characterized by good works. Again, Paul's instruction to Titus, this time in in Titus 2 verse 14, he says, "...who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness," that is, who we were, "...and to purify for himself a people for his own possession." This is who we now are, who are zealous for good works. This is what we are doing. Paul's use of the word zealous was quite intentional, I'm sure. The zealots of that day were known for being fanatical and jealously protected their Jewish heritage. They incited the rebellious uprising against the Romans, and that was only eventually crushed with the destruction of the temple in AD 70. But Paul is not calling on Titus, <clears throat> excuse me, or his readers to be religious fanatics. Instead, he's saying in the same way that zealots um, are, are zealous for their faith and for their Jewish heritage, let us rather be distinguished in, our, in the way that we relate to good works. Are we jealous for the good works of God? You see, as unbelievers... As we considered in the first point, we had no desire for the things of God. Our desires are changed and changing, and indeed we are zealous or jealous for the things of God because our lives are now a testimony for His glory. Our lives are characterized by good works as evidence of our new life in Christ. And this is exactly what Paul speaks about again in Ephesians We know those words from Ephesians 2 verse 8 that says, Salvation is a gift of God and not a result of works, lest lest any man should boast. And then he goes on to say in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let's just park there for a moment. We are his workmanship. Now, an obvious translation of that word workmanship would mean something that is made, right? Or something that is produced. But I found it significant that it also refers to a fabric. Something that is woven. And when we continue to read that we are created in Christ, I tend to form this picture in my mind of us being woven into Christ. And therefore our lives display what... Christ's life displayed, doing the will of the Father. Our lives now have value because we are alive in Christ. Our lives have purpose because we are now new creatures in Christ. Our lives have new desires because our Heavenly Father has called us to a life of holiness. What about some other references that might help us in this? 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, which are our words, in conduct, which is our behavior, in love, in faith, in purity. Galatians 6 verse 9 and 10, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Hebrews 10, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another. Don't stop there. (laughs) I wonder how many of us take pleasure in stirring up one another. But we are to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's verses 23 to 26. Notice from these verses with me that there's 
there's a very particular focus. These good works are not performed or practiced in isolation. God does not save us. He does not save us and draw him to himself to go out into the world as these individual islands of good works. No, as with the rest of Scripture, all that God has done through Christ Jesus is to redeem a people for himself, his church. And that's why Paul says in those first two passages, set the believers an example. Do good to everyone, and especially to those of the household of faith. And the writer to the Hebrews, let us consider. God's design for the believer is community. It's the body, it's fellowship, it's relationships. And it is in this context that we practice these good works. It's in this context where we see the examples of good works in other believers. And then we go out into the world and we live those good works. We imitate Christ before a dead world that is watching. It is in the context of the body where we are sharpened by the truth of the gospel. And our saltiness becomes saltier, and our light is refined to burn brighter, and then we go forth and we live as salt and light in the world. Spurgeon said it this way, we have been clear upon the fact that good works are not the cause of our salvation. Let us be equally clear upon the truth that they are the necessary fruit of it. Lastly tonight, let us consider the purpose of good works. We have seen that we are not saved by good works, but that once we are saved, good works are the evidence that saving faith is at work in us. And there are many ways in which believers display good works, both in the faith-based community of the church as well as before a watching world. Legan Duncan hinted at the assurance Paul had regarding the, the faith of the Thessalonian believers in our catechism video, where he pointed to 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, where Paul could say that they displayed before God a work of faith. They labored in love. They had a hopeful endurance. All of these being works. Spurgeon again identified four categories that he believed encompassed the good works of the believer, works of obedience to God and his word, works of love to God and fellow men, works of faith, all that we do in reliance upon God and his promises, and then acts of common life, doing all to the glory of God in this life. The categorization of good works might be helpful to you, and it might, be, might give you a list of, of some things you could do as a, as a believer and I'm not going to go through a list tonight. I do want to encourage you that as you read through the New Testament, make note of those things that are identified as works of the believer. What does the world see in us as an outworking of the, the salvation that has taken place in our lives? But I do want us to come back to that text verse in Matthew 5. If your Bible is still open, if you can have a look with me at Matthew 5, and particularly verse 16. Jesus says there, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the same way. This is Jesus saying, therefore, just like Tommy explained to us this morning. What, is, what has he declared believers to be? Well, in the previous three verses, he says, you are salt, you are light. This is who you are in Christ. The light analogy is carried forward into verse 16, but I believe the teaching applies just as strongly to, to salt. I've been working in the food industry for, for 27 years, and it's, it's hard to stay away from the food analogies. Um, but just as we see the example of light, with both the salt and light, Jesus is saying, make a difference. That is who we are as believers, make a difference. Salt makes a difference by adding flavor, adding taste. In some foods it works as a tenderizer, in others as a preservative. Light 
makes a difference by driving back the darkness. It can give warmth and a sense of security. Light helps us to make sense of what we are seeing, colors, shapes, images. Believer, what flavor is the salt of your testimony adding in the lives of those around you? Do you taste different? Or would the world not even notice you because you perceive to be bland or even tasteless like the lost? Is the light of your life in Christ shining brightly before men or are you, like this verse says, trying to subdue it, cover it, or even hide it? Jesus teaches us here that the salt and the light of our testimony and our good works brings about praise in the hearts of men. Not praise for us, not for the one doing the good deeds, but rather for our Father in heaven. Our good works are never merely for the temporal well-being of the person who is benefiting from it, but it should ultimately be for their eternal well-being, for their eternal well-being. Good works before a watching world has redemptive power. Are they driven to respond in worship of God rather than man? The glory that Jesus speaks of here is, is praise that exudes from a heart ransomed from death and made alive through him. Peter, who we're studying in the morning, he would phrase the words of his Savior in this way, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Paul would say to the Philippian church, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. How can the heathen, the Gentile that Peter speaks of, glorify God on the day of visitation? Unless that encounter with God through the life and testimony of those believers turn their hearts to serve the only living and true God. And as we conclude tonight, let's consider some questions of application. Are you being salt and light in the world? Are you being salt and light in the world? How is your saltiness? How bright? Is your light? Are your works for the Lord visible to the watching world or are you trying to hide them? Young believer, mature believer, church member, when your unsaved sibling, unsaved spouse, unsaved work colleague, unsaved family member, unsaved friend, unsaved, you fill in the gap, looks into your life, can they see your good works? Can they see God at work? Will they one day glorify God as their father on the day of visitation? May our lives be more than words. Let's close in prayer as we prepare for our time of prayer together tonight. Let me just give you a moment to consider what we've looked at through the scriptures tonight regarding being salt and light to the glory of God. Father, we thank you tonight for the work that you have called us to. We thank you that you, in your grace and mercy, reached out into lifeless hearts of men. And through your spirit, you have brought us life. You have renewed us. Not only that, you have restored us into a relationship with you. And so tonight we thank you, Lord, for your gift of salvation.
Thank you for Jesus Christ who purchased that gift with his body and life in full submission to you. Thank you for his example, Lord, and thank you even in in his brief life here on earth, he could show us what it was to be salt and light, even in the midst of opposition and persecution. So, Lord, I pray that our testimony before a watching world would be one that points others to Christ. Father, if there's any of us here that seek the praise of men, won't you put that desire out of our our lives, Lord? Help us only to direct praise and glory to your name. Help us to seek to, to exercise those gifts and those works amongst the body here, within the church context, and then to go out into the world and to shine the light of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would save many through the testimony of believers from this church. We pray, Lord, that we would endeavor to use more than words, but by our lives, by our actions, we would display the grace and mercy of Christ that has redeemed us. Bless us now as we approach our time around your throne in prayer. Pray, Lord, that you would continue to um, just feed us even in this time. Your name we pray.